I hope all is well with everyone today. I would like to thank everyone involved in the 24th Annual Racial Justice Summit for having us here. Thank you for being a valuable part, valuable part of giving Black, Brown, and, and Indigenous people a voice. You are truly appreciated. My name is Keena James, and I am a chef by trade, owning my own catering business called Cravings. I am also an artist, activist, one of the leaders of the 2020 uprising and movement in Pittsburgh and the coalition organizer for the Alliance for Police Accountability. So right now I'm gonna introduce you to the team. Uh, we are all a part of the Alliance for Police Accountability, but we also all wear uh, many hats as individuals. Brandy Fisher is the founder and president of the Alliance for Police Accountability, APA, founded in March 2010. Ms. Fisher personifies love for community, is a strong voice for justice, and teaches us how to be fearless in the face of oppos opposition while never compromising principles to please others for self gain. She has organized and led several protests and campaigns seeking systemic change within the criminal legal system and justice for individual victims and survivors of brutality at the hands of law enforcement officers. Ms. Fisher also assists in writing and introducing policies and legislation that promote equity and lessen the detrimental impacts of the local criminal legal system and people's lives in particular black families. Policies such as the decriminalization of marijuana in the city of Pittsburgh to the most recent ballot initiatives to ban no-knock warrants and extremely restrict solitary confinement in the Allegheny County Jail. Ms. Fisher, the mother of two adult children, formerly owned and operated a family child care center for 18 years, and has over 15 years of experience in designing curriculum and programming for youth. She is a foster mom who is also an advocate for children in the foster care system. Her personal passions are leadership development, collaboration, and dismantling systems of oppression. Next up, we're gonna introduce Alexis Mighty. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Alexis Mighty is a queen of many crowns. She grew up in the Lincoln Limington area where she is an active leader role model in her community and secondary schools. She graduated from the University of Pittsburgh Green, Greensburg in 2019, where she obtained a bachelor's of science degree in biology with a chemistry minor to continue her path in veterinary medicine. In the wake of the pandemic, Alexis became a business owner of All Things Luxury LLC and a lead activist in Pittsburgh. Alexis has organized and led many protests seeking justice for the families of police brutality victims, along with serving under, underserved communities in any way she can. She currently is a dance hall instructor and works with the Alliance for Police Accountability, helping to reconstruct the criminal justice system and create long lasting change. Last but certainly, certainly not least, my guy, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse Wozniak is a scholar of policing and imperialism who teaches criminolo criminology and sociology at West Virginia University. He is the author of numerous scientific studies of, of policing, including his recent book, Policing Iraq, Legitimacy, Democracy, and Empire in a Developing State. Jesse, Jesse is the chair for the Law and Policy Committee at the Alliance for Police Accountability, as well as being a team leader. Today, we will discuss the power of community and creating long lasting change. The uprising in 2020 movement in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania will be a time of our lives that we will never forget. As you are all aware, 2020 is a year that the Black Lives Matter movement made history as one of the largest movements in the country. In the wake of the death of George Floyd, 
26 million Americans erupted into full protests fueled by tragedy. All 50 states of America and over 60 countries, motivation was rebirthed. It cannot be denied that the world heard our message. We weren't allowed to go to the store. We weren't allowed to jog. We weren't allowed to sleep in our own beds. We weren't allowed to be in crisis. We weren't allowed to ride a bike. We weren't allowed to go camping. We weren't allowed to walk down the street. We weren't allowed to whistle. We weren't allowed to sing. We weren't allowed to speak. Our deaths weren't important enough to thoroughly investigate, fire, and charge the persons responsible. Tired of seeing lives lost and without consequence at the hands of those who are exposed, who are supposed to serve and protect us, we flooded the streets. Having the courage to say we will endure this more, we will endure this no more, and more importantly, we did something about it, as, just as our ancestors have done for us in the past. From house calls to car rallies, Kind of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just seen that, sorry. From house calls to car rallies to protests to vigils, months spent at Freedom Corner to youth-led drums and arts-driven civil Saturdays to change in law and policy, our fight continues. There was no other option but to go from protest to power as we yelled George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the many other names of those taken away too soon, we made sure to uplift our stolen local loved ones as well. After over 100 demonstrations being met with rubber bullets, tear gas, and handcuffs, activism, organizing, and mo mobilizing were surely met with trauma. It was also met with anger, love, protection, and community. New friendships and forever families were created. We left every day knowing in full belief that Black is beautiful and that all Black lives matter. Since the Global Black Lives Matter movement, we have seen more, more officers getting fired and charged for their crimes. 38% of Black people in America have quit their jobs to start their own businesses, bringing the total of Black-owned businesses in America to a whopping 1.5 million. Here to tell you from their own experience is Brandy Fisher and Alexis Mike. Thank you, Brandy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Brandy Fisher. I hope all of you are doing well today. Um, I wanna just briefly tell you um, about my experience as an activist in the city of Pittsburgh um, for over uh, the past 10 years. Um, I, the Alliance for Peace Accountability was founded in 2010. It was birthed out of a local police brutality case. Um, a young man by the name of Jordan Miles, who many of you may be familiar with, um, was a high school Catholic student at the time. And he was brutally beaten in his neighborhood, which was Homewood, um, about three doors up from his own home. And at the time I was, you know, my son and Jordan are two years apart. And I was sitting at home and I seen this on the news. Um, I was teaching Sunday school at church and I operated a child care center. Um, and so I've always had a passion for youth. And I think the thing that hit me the most about the story at the time was not just the police um, and the community issue, but it was that he was so very young. Um, I, I just couldn't imagine as a mother of someone um, very close to his age that I would have to do so much to my child um, to subdue them. Um, Jordan was brutally beat uh, to the point where his mother did not recognize him. He was also arrested and placed in Allegheny County Jail um, on trumped up charges as a result of his interaction with the police. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the story very briefly, it was in January, January the 12th to be exact, um, 2010, the day after Jordan Mouse's birthday. Uh, he, was, he had just turned um, 18, which allowed them to take him, a day before had just turned 18, which allowed them to take him to Allegheny County Jail. Um, he was 
he his grandmother lived um, behind him, um, and he often walked uh, to their um, house at 11:30 at night um, to stay with her, so she wouldn't stay alone. Um, and on his way there that day, uh, there was unmarked vehicle full of three um, undercover um, uh, plain clothes um, white police officers uh, who jumped out on Jordan as he was walk as he came out of his house took a few steps up the street. This car screeches up at 11.30 at night, um, tenant windows, dark blue car. And of course, the first thing Jordan does is run. He doesn't know who it is. He doesn't know if it's a drive-by shooting. He doesn't know he's about to be robbed. He doesn't know what's going on. Um, so he takes off. They chase him and they beat him. They beat him in the head, in the head with a flashlight. Um, those long flashlights the police officers used to carry. I don't know if they still do. I haven't seen them in a while. Um, but he, he, he was really beaten in his head and his face, punched, kicked several times, even by the police officer's testimony. Um, they said it was because they thought he had a gun. Um, no weapon was found. They said, oh, it was a pop bottle instead. No pop bottle was found. Um, it was absolutely for no reason but the fact that he was black in a neighborhood that they consider to be very high crime and full of people up to no good. And so that is what brought me out into this work. Um, and got me started into this work. What kept me in this work was the fact that it was it seemed nearly impossible to get justice um, for especially young people, um, you know, being targeted often, women being targeted often, um, and uh, you know, and we have to be here for one another, right? Um, when it comes to activism, activism is, is is a holistic thing, right? It's not just about protest. You know, most people think activism and they think protest. Protest is actually the last thing um, that we do when it comes to the work um, and activism. But we also have to take care of one another, as Kina highlighted, right? And so we have to t create programs um, to help our communities heal from these traumas and also thrive in the midst and face of them. Um, and so, um, as you can see on the slide, you know, we have done um, we do we do multiple things, whether it's door knocking. Um, there's a picture on here with our state rep, uh, Summer Lee, and myself out in the community door knocking um, after the Antoine Rose uh, murder, right? We're talking to community, we're connecting to people, we're finding out, you know, how they feel. We're also moving them into action. We're door knocking, we're registering people to vote. Um, you know, it's very important that we get involved in this political process, um, you know, it's one thing to protest, but there are people who are sitting in seats that, that are the reason that this is happening, right? These things are not, you know, police officers are not magically getting away uh, with these tactics. Um, school police officers, um, you know, school discipline policies are not magically being created. Somebody's writing them, right? And so we also need to make sure we're putting people in these seats that think like you and I, who know um, that equity is important and who value huma humanity. Uh, the, this leads me to, um, you know, the, the recent uprisings. Um, as you know, the APA was started in 2010, Black Lives Matter started in 2012, right? So we were out here beginning to do this work a little bit before the national movement started and when it wasn't as popular as it has become. Um, and so, you know, it, we were kind of revolutionary in that way um, and, and not stopping. Um, and so what we also want to remember um, in this movement, and I like to highlight and bring to the movement, is love, right? We have to, the foundation of our work, the foundation of activism is love, right? Is love for our communities, is love for justice, is love for ourselves, and is love for humanity. So when we're doing this work, it's coming from a passionate place because it's about our lives. Um, and, 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 and that's why we're so relentless about it. Um, it was lovely to see so many people, you know, after doing this work for so many years, come out um, after the murder of George Floyd. It was sad that the reason was such a tragedy, but it was beautiful to see so much unity. Between that um, and this political cycle of Trump being into office, it really brought a lot of people together. Um, you know, we came out in masses in a, in a time where they was telling us to stay in a house because there is a pandemic on our lives. There's a pandemic of racism. There's a pandemic of violence, state sanctioned violence. And so we have to continue to not just fight for the health of our lives, right? You know, not just not to get a virus, but we have to, there's a lot of things impacting our lives that we have to continue to fight for 
to thrive and survive in this movement. Um, and the uprising of 2020 um, was also met with a lot of um, abuse, a lot of uh, abuse from police, um, a lot of violence from police, just because we stood strong and fearless and relentless. And a lot of the um, young leaders that came up um, refused to stand back, refused to stand down in the face of that abuse, right? And so they were painted as if they were the perpetrators or the aggressors of what was happening to them in the streets. Um, and it was the exact opposite. Right. Police are coming in with the weapons. They're coming with the riot gear. They're coming with the guns, with the tear gas, with the smoke bombs, with the tasers. And we're coming with our voice, with our love and with our power and unity. And we fought back with our love and our voice and our unity. And um, I can recall when we went to the mayor's house to protest him allowing the militarization of these police officers and for them to deal with citizens in his city as if they were at war. And I recall when they told us to move um, from in front of the mayor's office and to go um, towards Mellon Park where we were going to be arrested. You know, it was the, a line of officers. They line up all the time, you know, um, and stand in front of us with their weapons. And so we walked, um, we went every way they told us to go. They told us what direction, what left turn to make, what street to go on. Um, and we followed those directions. And when we got to Mellon Park, it was extremely dark. You cannot see a thing in that park. And they then told us that we were violating um, the, the new rule that they have put in for a curfew and that um, the park was closed. And so because the park was closed, we needed to leave. This is the same park they instructed us to walk to to go to. Um, and as soon as we got there less than two minutes, they said that we were now in violation and needed to leave. Um, and instead of, and they pushed us back into this park further and further from the sidewalk. You know, first we were all on the sidewalk because it was very dark in the park. Um, they moved us into the grass and then pushed the line further back. Um, you can see the picture in the right hand, um, bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, and that is that, that is the, picture of us at Mellon Park. And so, and you can clearly see the sidewalk is empty. And it was the sidewalk that we were all standing on and they pushed us further back into this park. Once they got us far, far enough into the park where it was too dark to see anything, um, they began to pepper spray everyone. They began to, to, to wreak their violence. And um, I recall um, myself, um, I have asthma. And as a result of that pepper spray that they lied and said they didn't use, I had an asthma attack and I passed out and I woke up in the park in the dark alone. I was, I, I was extremely afraid of what had happened because I wasn't sure. And then what was going to happen next because I didn't know who was around me. I didn't even know where I was at the time. And I wasn't the only one impacted that day by tear gas and by being hit. Um, with batons and met with that balance. Many of us in that park um, had to recuperate, um, couldn't breathe, um, needed milk for our eyes. Um, and the people who came to my aid, though I was alone, were my fellow activists, my fellow colleagues. Um, they made sure they found me. My mother lives all the way in North Carolina and they called her. Um, they made sure um, that they found us. And as Keena mentioned, you know, as though we were met with this balance, though there was a lot of trauma, there also was a lot of love that sustained us through that time and still sustains us through these days. Um, a lot of unity that came together. Um, but those, those, these, these tactics are real, right? And then, you know, the news reports often say the opposite. And so, um, you know, in the uprising of 2020 and the future uprisings um, that will continue to happen, um, you know, the, the, the key is to make sure that we stick together and that we come together, not only in the streets, but when it comes to those polls to get these people out of office who allow these things to happen. Thank you. And now we're gonna hear from the queen that wears many crowns, Miss Alexis Mighty. Hi, all. Can we hear me? 
All righty. So my name is Alexis Mighty, and I work with uh, the Alliance for Police Accountability. And I want to start talking about the effect that or the impact that COVID had on the movement. Um, the beginning of shutdown was the rise of it all. The impact of COVID forced people out of their houses, pushed people into the streets to hear, learn, and see how cruel our system is. As we know, most of America lost their jobs and had little to no income. 18.1 million people were employed uh, in June, and 63% of those people were unable to work because their employer closed or they lost the business due to this pandemic. So while being stuck in their homes and forced to watch a TV or a telephone screen and learn TikTok dances, forced to listening to quiet streets and the same news and stories about COVID-19, um, we happened to find a video of the tragic and unlawful death of George Floyd that took place. Um, it was recorded on camera for the whole nation to see. And mind you, the whole world's mental health was at stake from being in quarantine and suicide rates and cases were all, also on the rise. So now we're viewing yet another senseless, reckless murder of another black man at the hands of the police. And due to this, an estimated amount of 15 to 26 million people took the streets. And those 15 to 26 million people were getting educated about the true history of America and what continues to happen in these streets. This pandemic allowed millions to learn about Black history and tragedies uh, more than what they learned in their entire 12 year education. Millions marched throughout the many hot summer days screaming that we matter, that Black lives matter opening eyes of how mothers have to teach their kids what to do when they encounter the police, opening their eyes of how we have to walk or how we can walk the street and not return home, um, opening our eyes of seeing how we can get off a school bus with only a cell phone in our pocket and being stopped and frisked for weapons, opening eyes to say, hey, we aren't criminals. We're little black boys and girls trying to dwell in this, dwell in this place called earth because we're all placed here for a reason. The pandemic amplified how corrupt the system is and how easily it is for cops to get away with their uh, quote unquote jobs. <laughs> uh, it opened their eyes that even while we're standing up for black lives peacefully, police continue to try to harm us while on camera, which heightened what we were stating to be true. It was opening their eyes that we are always, um, working behind the scenes and it's not always about protests. Opening their eyes, our protests bring a call to action to say, hey, look at me, I matter. Why are we doing this? And how can we change this? Opening people's eyes to say, this can easily be you. And this takes me to Freedom Corner. Um, I was introduced to Daniel Brown, also known as Mama Brown throughout the community, uh, through Miss Michelle Kinney, the mother of Antoine Rose at a Juneteenth celebration in 2020. Um, Mama Michelle introduced her and said that she needed help seeking justice for her son, Marquise Jalen Brown, who sadly lost his life on Duquesne University's campus. At the time, I was a leader of the Pittsburgh I Can't Breathe organization where we held her first action that following weekend. Um, there is when we learned uh, the full story about what happened to Mama Brown and her son. Uh, she stated that he was on camera skipping down the hallway and next he was in his dorm room with campus police and they were trying to de-escalate a mental health crisis. Then somehow, as they were trying to de-escalate de the situation, he managed to pick up a chair, break a window and jump out a window, leaving the gash on his head as well. For two years, Mama Brown didn't have any answers. For two years, she didn't have the strength to investigate her son's death, which she shouldn't have to do. And for 237 days, she endured a hunger strike waiting for Duquesne to meet her demands. Her demands were to have full access to the information on her son's death so she can perform an independent investigation. She wanted the campus police to have body cameras and for them to receive mental health crises de-escalation training. I don't think that was too much of an ask. Um, but what hurt me the most was the lack of transparency Duquesne displayed when it came to tell Mama Brown about what happened to her own son. She barely knew any facts, had no actual evidence or seen any pictures of her son after two years. 
They continued to paint her as an angry Black mother who wouldn't leave their campus and was spreading COVID. Mind you, Mama Brown was on a hunger strike. She kept her mask on, always checking temperatures, hand sanitizer. She didn't have the opportunity to catch it because her body was also already fighting a pandemic in herself. But it was also a reminder um, not to believe the media. For centuries, the media has portrayed African-Americans and Black people as aggressive savages and so much more. But if you have met Mama Brown, she was nothing but sweet and giggly, always had a smile on her face, and she was just a joy to be around. And sadly, this incident with her son was another case of the police shouldn't have been the first responders to the mental health crises, especially when they aren't trained to be in that position. It seems like public safety has turned into public enemies. Mama Brown pushed back her plate and her only meal was justice. It was so hard to watch this plump woman dwell down to a size smaller than I am now and to know the reason was even more heartbreaking. Due to her stance, Mama Brown established the Marquise Jalen Brown Foundation in honor of her son. She created this platform that amplifies the voices of mothers and students to promote police transparency and accountability, mental health, and the demand of timely and appropriate responses when faced with social injustice in a judicial and collegiate setting. Um, and I'm gonna move into what motivate me to keep going and to seek justice. Um, what initially motivated me to keep going was feeling, seeing, and hearing the strength of our Black mothers who were grieving. The essence of the grief, however, was beautiful. And that may sound weird, but how well they carried their spirits while battling the continued absence of the seeds they planted, the triumph and tribulations they bore to uphold a movement with millions of freedom finders standing behind, beside, and in front of them. Our Black mothers stepped out on faith, doing things they never thought possible. So the same thing doesn't happen to me, you, or anyone else that looks like us. And who am I not to stand behind someone who's fighting for me, especially when they carry the backs of millions? They gave me the strength to toil on. It's empowering when you can just call to check on them because the burden they carry is very heavy and they end up checking on you and passing enough energy to lift you up and keep fighting. It was rare when we saw some mothers temporarily dropping their shoulders of exhaustion, but when we did, we knew there was still pressing work that had to be done and that we had to be the ones to hold them up. What motivates me to show up every day is that every time I did show up, there was progression. Every day and every time that we showed up was progression. I can easily be a victim. Black families are considered to be the lowest part of the justice food chain. I remember holding my nephew for the first time, which made me want to protect that blessing from everything possible. I fight for him and every other blessing because they deserve to have a fair chance at life. If respected officials and people of power aren't following the rules, how can we? The law isn't upholding the law. When the police and other officials took an inch, we definitely ran that mile. It keeps pressure on those in power to let them know we are not letting up and they need to do their jobs and continue to do their jobs. Because if us civilians mess up, make a mistake or even fear for our lives, we still have to be punished for our crimes, which can be result in death. So why aren't they? What faith can I put in the system that doesn't follow their own principles? Part-time work only gets part-time pay. I can't show up to a job doing part-time work in hours and expect a salary without taxes. But when you do show up and add a pep to your step and apply pressure, you work your way, you work your way up the ladder to make diamonds. I see those challenges as opportunities to get better. And I think we're heading back to Brandy Fisher and thank you for your time. I think just we wanted to open up some space um, to interact with the participants, you all who are here, right? We, if anybody is familiar with our organization, um, we do. We are just, you know, down to earth folks. Um, if you're, if you're familiar with any of us here on the call, um, and so we really like to engage and hear from you. And so, are there any questions, comments um, that anyone has? You can either unmute yourself or drop it in the chat, whichever makes you feel comfortable.
Anyone at all? Anyone surprised by anything they heard? Anyone hear anything they didn't know? Hello. Um, I have Hello. A um, I have a um, my name is Free. I'm with Transuniting. Hi, Kina. Um, and I was just wondering. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys could talk about, you know, community amongst like different activist organizations and like what support, um, you know, APA is given and then received. Uh, I guess. Does that make sense? Um, I can, yes, it does. I can respond to that first. Um, you know, <clears throat> APA is an alliance of organizations. So we're, um, an or we are, we consist of over 30 organizations. Um, collaboration, um, especially in the movement space is extremely important. One, it's about, um, you know, resources, right? Um, it's being, or being black led organizations, organizations out here fighting things that the system um, is uh, designed uh, to continue to push down, um, it you know it's uh, it's not always um, easy to get resources to help you do that work. Um, and so by us all working together, we leverage our own skills, talents, and gifts, um, you know, to be able um, to push in the movement. It also is it also um, opens up the conversation and people's visions and um, of understanding of who is all impacted by state sanctioned, state, um, state sanctioned ballots, right? Um, and the fact that, especially, um, you know, cause we part with TransUniting um, and I know Kina is gonna talk about this a little going forward, but you know, there's people in our trans community um, who are impacted by this violence often and are not mentioned, right? There are people um, who are just poor and maybe not black who are, because this is a class and a race issue. Um, very much so, um, who may not be mentioned. And there are a lot of women um, uh, who are murdered often um, and are not mentioned. And so it's important for us to collaborate as organizations and institutions, and especially because we all have our different strengths. Um, and I like to compare it to the body. So somebody might have heard me say this before because I really believe in it. You know, we have two arms, two eyes, two legs, um, but they come from different angles and they have different functions and help us balance out. And that's the same thing with different organizations and entities. Like we need each other um, and our own expertise and our rights to come together as a whole, as one body, um, to, as, and with one goal to make sure not only equity happens, but that the power is with the people when it comes to the decisions being made about what impacts our lives. And so collaboration is important in anything that you do. Um, and it is a free question. Does anybody else have any questions? Does anybody else have any questions? I'd also throw out that as presenters are talking, we're paying attention to the chat. So if you have any questions that come up as, as any of the presentations are going on, throw them down in the chat and we'll definitely get to them. I have a question for uh, the participants. So my question to you, and uh, again, you can come off mute. Uh, an answer question, or you can drop your response in the chat and we'll read it. Um, my question is, do you believe movement has created change in Allegheny County? Um, yes. <laughs> I would say yes. I think that uh, we uh, really uh, participated in getting the, um, the ballot on uh, and winning um, sol ending solitary confinement in Allegheny County Jail. And I just gotta say, I think this, this uh, APA is a wonderful organization and always very welcoming for to anybody in any group. Thank you, Ms. Wada. We appreciate you too. And as uh, Brandy spoke about earlier, APA is uh, an organizations. Um, our coalition 
is extremely diverse. We have people, we have organizations from the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we have uh, Jewish organizations, uh, Latinx organizations, um, black led organizations. So uh, we, we have, and, and organizations that focus on different aspects of this work. Um, and, you know, we believe that that's important about uh, law and policy change and uh, being inclusive of everyone to make sure that uh, everyone is getting equal treatment because that's what we're fighting for is a, for a fair world for all. Jesse, is there anything in the chat? Oh yeah, there's a whole bunch in the chat. I was uh, about to come in, but uh, one, one of the first questions that came up was talking about collaboration. Um, so uh, Mallory wanted to know more about the act of collaborating and what it actually looks like in practice. Well, we have many things that you can participate in. <laughs> uh, we um, currently have committees. Uh, as I spoke about earlier, Jesse chairs the Law and Policy Committee. committee. Uh, I chair the Outreach and Action Committee. We will uh, soon have a Youth Committee, uh, Education Rights Committee, and a Field and Electoral Committee as well. And if anybody would like to join any of those committees, feel free to reach out to me at kjames at apa-pgh.org. Um, can somebody drop that in the chat? <laughs> I can't do it right now. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, different programs. We do Love Days, which is our version of a community day. So we go into low-income neighborhoods. Uh, we set up bounce houses, face paint. We have a DJ. We cook food. We provide food boxes for them to take home. Um, we also provide a plethora of uh, different types of resources, everything from free prison reentry to child care. Um, and we do that, we, we do that, uh, we do those love days uh, from like May to, to basically like when it gets cold. <laughs> um, so uh, if there's anything you want to participate in, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll go over this again. But feel free to reach out. Uh, Jesse, is there anything else in the chat? That you want to get to? Yeah, I think one question that really yeah. stood out to me is interesting is, is we have a question of how has movement work changed over the years since APA began doing its work? Brandy, you want to take that one? Um, sure. And just a little bit on the collaboration piece, I do want to just um highlight how we share power. Um so you know, uh, in our in our coalition, um, we have a group in which we communicate with all of our coalition partners. And when things arise, um, you know, political officials send us, um, you know, a policy and they want questions, they need feedback on it. You know, we don't take that and say, oh, we just give that feedback. We send that to our entire coalition of organizations. We inform them of what's going on and we make this decision, um, these decisions together moving forward. You know, um, this is what we're thinking. What do you all think? Do we think this is best? Um, here's a document, um, you know, of the legislation. Everybody can weigh in and give their feedback of what it should say, what should be written. I mean, we have a true collaboration and true collaboration does share power. Um, as far as how the movement has changed, um, one, um, I think it's become more um, palatable um, for people in power because so many people um, have gotten involved. Um, you know, like I said, in 2010, when APA started, it was before BLM, which was emerged in 2012. And we were met with a lot of negativity, like a lot of, you know, don't talk to them, don't be seen with them. Um, because we were unapologetic and relentless and, um, you know, and uh, speaking truth uh, to power and making demands. Um, and so I think that uh, what has happened um, is, uh, our communities, particularly in Allegheny County and our region, being more educated on what has occurred, also um, understanding that there is truth to it. 
um, because there was, we were met with a lot of skepticism. Why would police be this way? Why would they do that? There's no reason a police officer would just act this way for no reason. Um, and then, you know, being able to show people, um, I think people are beginning to see the bigger picture of intersections, right? The school to prison pipeline, how students are now, you know, instead of being suspended for fights or being charged with assault and being arrested, how six-year-olds are in handcuffs. Um, you know, I think once you, we, we brought awareness to this thing, people start looking into it for themselves um, just to find out the truth of it. Uh, and I think that a lot more of our partners, um, you know, our Jewish community um, is really active when it comes to the movement here um, locally um, and really close partners. Um, you know, um, our immigrant community, we work together. And so I think that a lot more people are seeing the intersections, the connections um, and how our oppression and freedom is tied together. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, we're we're going to move on to the next section for time's sake. Um, okay. So, I mean, we're, Brandy, it's still you. Next slide. <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about the mission of APA? Yeah, I was ready to say, she wants me to talk a little bit about um, the mission of the Alliance for Peace Accountability um, and what we're here for. Um, Alliance for Police Accountability, as you can see, the name is very single issue focused, right? Because when we started off, it was about holding police officers accountable. It was our belief at that time that if there was some accountability um, when off for officers' actions, that the community um, then can have a better relationship, right? And maybe build some trust. Um, we have grown to really see that it is an entire system. Um, and, and have moved to focusing on reconstructing the criminal legal system as a whole. And we use legal on purpose um, because as you can see, we're putting justice back into the legal system. Um, and so, uh, you know, the mission is really focused on all the intersections when it comes to the criminal legal system, uh, right? And so we've learned that, uh, we've seen that the district attorney is responsible for the lack of justice that we see often um, because of uh, his decisions that he's making um, or in that office. Uh, we also see that the chief of police matters um, when it comes to these matters. Um, and then also when we're looking at the laws, right? We're like these laws that exist and these policies that exist are really what people are leaning towards when they say they make these decisions in the name of the legal system. It's that this, according to the law, according to their training, um, you know, you'll hear that a lot. Um, and so focus on policy is a very big part of what we do. So we advocate for individuals, um, whether that is people incarcerated currently at Allegheny County Jail, whether that is everyday people in the community like yourself, or um, you know, whether that are people within the school system. So we advocate for individual injustices. Um, and we try to educate the community on these issues, right? We don't wanna tell people what to do and tell people how to act. We wanna educate them so they're moved once they know the truth to do something about it. Um, and we help navigate um, what that looks like. And then lastly, we wanna change policies um, that have impacted the community. Um, and so I do wanna give you a little bit of background about some of the work um, that APA has done, um, you know, going um, forward. Um, I don't, in um, Governor Wolf has, uh, we were able to work with him to successfully veto um, a law that was called the secrecy bill, right? And what they wanted to do is say that police officers who are investigated um, for abuse of power or for um, you know um, the use of deadly force, that they would not say their names. The media would not say their names. The 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 department that they work in wouldn't say their names, and so. Well, no one would mention the name of the officers, right? It was the secrecy bill that would protect them. The premise for this bill um, was that was that was put out by Republicans was this was that saying that for people to know their names, it was putting these police officers at risk. It was risking their safety, right? Every time they permit put a law or a policy or anything that they do is like this fair tactic um, that we use. Um, and so that was the premise of this bill, that police officers would remain safe if people knew their names, you know? And so we pushed back on that, of course, because the lack of transparency is horrible. We need to know these police officers' names because as we see with um, uh, Rossville, who murdered Antoine Rose II, 
right? He was at several different police departments before he got there um, with several different complaints about his abuse of power. And so we need to know and be transparent about this and uh, what's going on. We also um, help author policy to decriminalize marijuana in the city of Pittsburgh. Yes, marijuana is decriminalized right now. Um, Jesse was on his call is going to be working in depth on um, looking at these arrests and what's going on with these numbers now so we can um, get back into chasing that policy to find out uh, you know, how it's being um, done. But you know, at the time in 2015, black youth, not black people, but black youth under age 18 were number one for marijuana possession arrests, right? It was just ridiculous. Um, and it also shows the over-policing um, of people, uh, of particular young black people. Um, and so uh, we've been in these movement spaces um, and, you know, and trying to change policy um, for quite some time. And the reason is, is because we consider that to be sustainable change. But at the same time, our communities are hurting and suffering because poverty is real. And Pittsburgh is segregated in the way that it is designed, right? We know where the black communities are and normally um, they are uh, underrepresented, underserved and full of dilapidated properties and neglected. And so we also go into our communities um, in, you know, in a program called Love Days and we, we go and we register everybody to vote, right? because we need to keep, we need to stay civically engaged, but we bring resources. There's a ton of nonprofit organizations in Allegheny County. Um, and you, it'll, it makes you wonder like, why is anyone suffering, right? We have all of these nonprofit organizations out here, all these social services, um, how come it's not enough? But a lot of people are not aware that they exist. There's just no outreach. Um, a lot of times there's no money for those nonprofit organizations to do outreach. Marketing is very expensive. Um, and sometimes there's a lack of will. And so we make sure that we take these plethora of resources to the front doors of our communities. Um, uh, whether it's, you know, how do you, um, how you can get a car to go to, to get to work, whether it's credit counseling classes, um, you know, uh, we take all of this information, um, whether it's childcare, uh, we partner with other organizations, part of our coalition and also outside of that, um, such as the Allegheny Health Department who brings out um, free bus passes, um, Narcan, which is needed. Um, believe it or not, so many people do come to the table for that. Um, free diapers, um, and we provide these services and meet our and meet the community's needs. Um, and so, holistically, um, you know, APA is about advocating because we have to fight for our rights. We're about educating because we need to be very informed so we know how to move and move strategically. And we're about changing policies because we need long-term sustainable change. And these are the things that govern our lives. Um, this past year, uh, you know, we pushed these two ballot initiatives, uh, one being ending solitary confinement or extremely restricting solitary confinement, Allegheny County Jail. We are still um, making sure, and I just want to highlight this, it's one thing to get a law passed, right? It's one thing to change policy. It's another to make sure it is enforced. So you have to stay on top of policies. Um, just because they get passed, it's not like, woo, woo, we won. Um, because we know people don't want these changes to happen. And so you have to stay on top of them to ensure that they are enforced um, as you go along. And so we are following the stop solitary confinement bill. Um, and Wharton Harper at Allegheny County Jail is doing his best not to abide by it. Um, recently, um, we and we've been working with the jail oversight board. Um, and recently, the jail oversight board pushed a motion um, uh, to state that they cannot have these weapons in the jail, right? These these guns that they use and they're shooting bean bags um, or at, at people in the jail, right? Um, just because somebody says I re I'm not coming out my cell, or you know they're using these bean bags and to extract them um, and for other different reasons, and just walking around with them. As we got reports from people who are being held at Allegheny County Jail, we're learning that they're just walking around holding them as they're walking um, as just a form of intimidation. And so the jail oversight board bet these weapons. But in the policy, it stated that you cannot bring in these weapons. But the essence of the of the policy was so that they would not be using them at all. Like we don't want them in the jail. That's why I said not to bring them in. And so what Wharton Harper says when we when he's questioned at the jail oversight board about this because we've got this report from people who are incarcerated, like they're still using these weapons and they're still walking around with them. His response was, well the 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 policy said not to bring them in. These are weapons that were already here. And so we're using the ones that were already here. 
And so you have to be very mindful and careful because they're gonna find any way they can because they don't want these changes to happen to supersede or to circumvent um, the very spirit of what we're trying to do, right? Um, and so that, I just wanted to give that an example. And that's where we are with the sol solitary confinement bill is really fighting um, the way that is being implemented and making sure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We set up a hotline um, at the organization for people who are incarcerated there to call and complain to us to let us know what is actually happening inside. And this is how we know. Um, and this is how we know what's going on in the streets with interaction with police because we are very connected um, to the people who we are working with um, on the side of and on behalf of. Um, and then the other thing was the Brianna Law that we got passed that Kina, um, Kina, do you mind? Cause I don't, I think I've been talking too long um, to talk about Brianna's Law and the impact <laughs> Um, and what that has done. Um, but we were successful in getting this done um, in the midst of a pandemic. And I just wanna highlight that solitary confinement is detrimental. If you wanna Google it, if you wanna look into it, it is a horrible practice. And we're talking about people who are held in pretrial detention, right? We think it's horrible for any jail to have this, but we're talking about people who are held in pretrial detention, meaning you are accused of something that you have not yet even been found guilty of. Um, it may very well not be. And you can go in a very healthy person and come out with problems you did not go into this jail with, right? Um, and so um, it, it is horrible. And, um, and and this is why it definitely needs to end. And it's also being used for things because of, you know, uh, correctional officers pride and ego, right? This power trip um, is being used because people are outside of their cell longer than they're supposed to be. Like you were supposed to go in 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, you're late, right? Is that a reason to put somebody and lock them up for 24 hours a day? Um, and then we were demanded that they have recreation time, right? I just want to highlight this. So we're like, they need to be out of that cell at least four hours a day. What they're doing is they're taking people out and if they still want to punish them because they're mad at them in some kind of way, oh, you're, you can get out the cell, but we're handcuffing you to the table. So you have people who are getting so-called four hours of rec time, but hours of that is being handcuffed to a table while they're out of the cell and sitting at this table. So they're still not getting any rec time, any movement, um, and they're still trying to find ways to circumvent. Like, yes, we gave them the four hours outside of their cell, but we 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 chained them to a table. Um, so they actually... So I just want to highlight some of the things that are, are happening surrounding what we're trying to do. And just so you can understand how the system really works and how the people who are in charge of the system um, are really uh, defying the law and trying to find many ways um, to circumvent it. And that happens not just with the laws that we are trying to implement, but with the laws that are already on the books, right? They try to circumvent any way that they can. Um, and so it's just necessary for us to stay on top of it. Um, and Brianna's law, we actually talked to Brianna's mom about this. Um, I was able to go to Kentucky and meet her. And she asked when we come back to Pittsburgh, if we made sure that we pushed this law because she wanted to get it everywhere in the state. Um, and so um, we took this, the Brianna's law up um, as well to end no knock warrants. And just to give you an idea, people wonder why like that's important and people try to paint the picture of, oh, you don't want, you're trying to give like criminals time to get away with things. But if you are a person inside your home and you're in your house right now, right? You have a three-year-old child, they're walking around your living room. Um, they don't know who's behind that door when they bust it down, right? They don't know where somebody is inside their home when they decide to just bust this door down. They also don't know if someone is able to legally carry a weapon and think someone is breaking into their home, right? There is many reasons why this exists. And people who don't want the things that we push often try to paint them in a picture um, that is inaccurate so people won't support them. So if you don't get anything else out of this conversation, please always speak to folks who are pushing for change so you can find out the, uh, and understand the reason behind them yourselves. Um, because often when you're not a part of these communities, uh, you have no idea what's, what's going on. Jesse, would you like to add to the solitary component? Yeah, I mean, I think what Brandy really highlighted and what I think is one of the strengths of APA is that we don't just sit on something once we've done it, right? I mean, uh, as you all know, right, May 21, voters overwhelmingly approved this ban on solitary confinement, right? Especially got to give a shout out to Kina and all the thousands of organizers who collected tens of thousands of signatures to get this on the ballot and to get people to do it, right? 
Uh, and so it went into effect December 21, right? Not supposed to be anybody in solitary confinement. And yet they still have 300 people in solitary confinement, right? That is 300 violations of the law. Uh, and so as Brandy was saying, this is the kind of thing that APA does is we don't just see that victory, but rather we sit there and we say, okay, but is this going to be implemented? And we are going to keep your feet to it because they continue to violate it in a number of ways. Uh, and so APA in conjunction with uh, a lot of other great organizations, especially shout out to the uh, Abolitionist Law Center, uh, who's keeping a really close eye on it, are making sure that this law doesn't just get implemented, but actually works in reality and actually keeps our, our community members safe while they're incarcerated. Thank you, Brandy and Jesse. Appreciate y'all. So just a, a little bit about uh, Brianna Taylor's law. Uh, we know Brianna was killed in Louisville, Kentucky in her sleep. Um, and the officers that went to the wrong house. And this is, this is often what happens during uh, no-knock raids. So more than 20,000 no-knock raids occur in the US every year. And they are increasingly used in low-risk, nonviolent drug investigations. Pittsburgh, too, has suffered. In the past six years, multiple settlement, settlements costing hundreds of thousands of dollars have been reached between the city and victims of such police raids. Five day officers are injured or killed in no-knock warrants every year. 10 to 12 citizens are killed every year for no-knock warrants. In one case, an 18-month-old baby suffered severe, severe third-degree burns from a flashbang grenade that was thrown into his crib through the window. In another case, a 75-year-old woman was killed. In both cases, the police had entered the wrong homes. Our initiative banned the use of no-knock warrants as justification for entering a dwelling without, announcings, without announcing oneself preventing extremely dangerous situations that result from unannounced police officer intrusion. Over a thousand individuals took to the streets to collect more than 67,000 signatures. In 49 days during the winter in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, 70% 70, 70 or more or more than 166,000 people voted to ban solitary confinement in Allegheny County Jail. 81% or more than 49,000 people voted to pass Breonna Taylor's law against the use of no-knock warrants. The people of Allegheny County and more than 30 partnering community-led organizations had a huge impact on the success of both Breonna Taylor's law and the ban on solitary confinement in Allegheny County Jail. We couldn't have done this without the community, and there is no community without unity. So uh, as you can see, we have a slide up. So if you know anyone who is suffering solitary confinement at Allegheny County Jail right now, uh, please call or email us. Our phone number is 412-708-5200, and our email address is info at apa-pgh.org. Do we have any questions from the participants? Uh, Beth, Beth has a hand raised, I see. Hi, Beth. Um, right now, we have two situations with the police of significant concerns because we got many but in particular what happened to Jim Rogers and what happened to Peter Spence can you give us an update on that and what we can do uh yeah so currently um I know that uh BPAP the black political Empowerment Party uh, and the Quakers as well are doing a lot of work when it comes to both of those cases. Uh, there are ongoing actions happening. Um, most recently, uh, this past weekend, um, there was an action for Peter Spencer. And Beth, I mean, you attended the press conference on Wednesday for Peter Spencer. Um, 
what I can say is uh, we'll keep everybody in the know moving forward. And again, um, if you want to stay in the loop on the Peter Spencer case and the Jim Rogers case or anything that has to do with APA, please feel free to uh, email me at kjames at apa-pgh.org. Brandy. I just wanted to respond to that a little. Um, uh, as far as um, Jim Rogers is concerned, uh, one of the things that have recently come to light, um, and and just for people's understanding in these cases, um, you know, it it takes uh, it it takes a little bit of work to make sure we're getting as much information as we can, um, especially when people don't want information to be released. Um, but one of the things I want to uh, pinpoint, um, as far as the movement is concerned, and for people to pay attention to, is something that. Um, one of my mentors, Dr. Sirwet, told me about um, very many years ago when I first started doing this work in 2010, and that is the medical examiner's reports. Um, often the medical examiner is used in a way um, uh, to hide things that happen um, in the police department. And so, and he was a medical examiner himself for Allegheny County for many years, and he wouldn't know more than anyone. Um, and so in Jim Rogers' case, what we see is that the death was ruled an accident. Um, which prevents certain sort of um, accountability from being able to happen, right? This is, it wasn't ruled a homicide. So it, just, it was ruled as an accident, um, which means that the district attorney can't file charges or, you know, it would, wouldn't, um, I mean, he could, but it, would, it, it wouldn't be, he couldn't file him for murder, right? Because they're saying this wasn't a homicide uh, based on the ME report. And so there's things that, um, and then in Peter's um, case, when you look at their ME report, right? And how it was ruled. Um, and then uh, working with Dr. Sowet's office, um, the family got an independent autopsy, right? And found out things that were, wasn't in the ME report. There, there, there was a different result that came out. And so we do now have access um, to be able to have independent autopsy, but they cost money, right? So if our organization wanted to be able to provide an independent autopsy to Jim Rogers' family, when it's occurred, it would cost money. Um, and so um, and we plan to be able to do that, but we have to do some fundraising to be able to pay for some of those things um, that, we, that we know really can, when these cases arise, can make a difference. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that um, about those two cases um, so people can pay attention to these medical examiner reports uh, and what goes on with them and how they're used um, sometimes to hide what actually has happened um, in these controversial cases. Um, and, you know, in, in these smaller places, um, you know, which is uh, extremely um, unfortunate that these folks are working together. And so to get the information um, in these smaller communities um, is even more difficult, right? Because everybody's working together to hide it. Um, and, and so I know that uh, one thing about our organization is we go where we're called, right? We don't chase things. Uh, we go, we're asked to come and we go over call. And when other organizations are working on things, we provide support. Like, how can we help? You know, how can we help navigate the system? Um, but we definitely respect the work of our partners and other organizations who are out here um, doing the work and helping families, uh, you know, get, things, go, uh, get through things. So if you ever wonder um, why there's something going on and if you wonder, like, why is APA not doing this or involved? Uh, one, it might be because the family, we have not spoken to them because we do not take a step, an inch, or make a statement without first talking to the family. Um, two, it might be because another organization has taken a lead to do this work and we're following um, you know, their lead. Um, but we are always willing to add our expertise. We are always willing to add our feet um, to the fire um, to help out and advocate for any situation. Thank you for that, Brandy. Thank you for that, Brandy. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next thing, which, uh, okay, let's see. I'm gonna share this video uh, with everybody. Uh, APA and One Hood has put out a report on reimagining public safety uh, and is currently doing the work to implement uh, implement what's in that report. I want to play, play you all a video um, from the press conference on uh, reimagined public safety. 
call for mental health distress should not end in someone losing their life. And that is one of the primary reasons that we are seeking alternatives to policing. When we have public health crises, police are not the proper people to respond to those. We have public professionals, health professionals to do so. But I think most importantly about our process is we also wanted to make sure that we were centering actual victims of police violence. This is why we felt like it was important to have Leon Ford Jr. on our steering committee, Michelle Kinney, the mother of Antoine Rose II on our steering committee because this was one of the things we also saw that was missing in some of these other processes. For everyone, a crisis is different. A crisis is different. It could come from, you know, some of the things we talked about. Lack of access to resources. So putting forth those who are trained in this field to respond to those calls. Having a police officer present is only going to escalate the situation, especially if we're talking about dealing with the black and brown community. It's essential to understand that violence is far more than just crime. Rather, violence is an experience that limits or diminishes people's capacity to survive. Unemployment, inadequate housing, lack of access to medical care, subpar public education systems, food insecurity, and racism are all violence. If you are actually at a shelter, some of the shelters in this region actually hire police officers to patrol and police on the shelters. So even if you are someone who's trying to reestablish your life, you're trying to do the right thing, you're still forced to encounter police and policing. If you want to reduce rather than increase harms related to drug use in our society, we must stop arresting and imprisoning people for drug use and treat this as a health issue, a public health issue, not a crime. Pittsburgh is already over policed. We currently have 31 officers for every 10,000 residents, which is almost double the number that comparable mid-sized cities have. We spend a third of the city's budget on public safety, but this has not made us safe. Sorry, y'all, trying to figure it out and getting used to it. Uh, uh, well, while Kino works back on the slides, I'll just jump in because I was going to talk about this uh, community report we had for visioning true, uh, public safety. Uh, I just dropped a link to the chat there. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at the report yet uh, or read it, uh, I think it's definitely worth your time. Um, as you got kind of an introduction from the video there about sort of what we were doing with this report and that a lot of people have suggestions about ways we could better improve uh, community safety or improve policing, right? I'm, a, I'm an academic who studies these kind of things. I've got all sorts of ideas. Uh, but one thing that we wanted to do in conjunction uh, with One Hood was really bring together communities that are actually affected by these practices, uh, people on the front lines working with these things uh, and helping people who are affected by these practices. Uh, if you're able to click on the link and open it, I think one thing that's great is to just turn to the second page there uh, and see everyone who is part of this coalition. Uh, and you can see it ranges from people who experience police abuse directly, uh, to people who work with those who have, to people who work around political issues, uh, to people who work with people experiencing um, drug abuse issues, to people who uh, do mental health counseling, uh, those kind of things you need them. And so over the course of spring 2021, uh, between APA and our partners One Hood, uh, we brought together this diverse coalition of people actually experiencing these kind of things to try to create a new way to envision what public safety could look like. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about uh, public safety and violence, people think only of violent crime. Uh, and how are we going to respond to violence if we don't have the police? But I think it's so great that the introductory video uh, had a great line from Jasiri that violence isn't just violent crime, right? Violence is anything that diminishes people's capacity to live and survive and thrive and, and live their lives, right? So violence is much more than the crime we see on the streets. Violence is people not having housing. Violence is people not being able to get um, safe supplies. People, uh, violence is people not being able to get food, right? Uh, violence is people being stigmatized for their mental health issues. As uh, we heard a statistic earlier, but I always want to bring it back up again, right? Half of all people killed by the police are experiencing some form uh, of mental illness or trauma, right? Uh, and yet we respond to that with armed guards. 
And so what we did was we brought uh, these community members together and worked on this vision in four separate ways, right? Responding to violence, uh, responding to homelessness, uh, responding to drug use, uh, responding to emergency situations, right? And looking at how we can do them with affected communities. Uh, and we also had several community sessions uh, where we brought drafts of this to the wider community uh, and asked them, does this make sense? Does this uh, correlate with your experiences or are there things we're missing? Uh, and using that feedback, we also talked to other organizations that have successfully instituted non-police responses, um, such as CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, uh, or Dasher in Denver, Colorado. Uh, these are both organizations that have been quite successful in sending unarmed, crisis-informed, in uh, mental health and trauma-informed counselors out to give people the help they need, uh, rather than sending out an armed police officer who likely doesn't have any training uh, or isn't able to provide any of these resources that we need. Uh, to put together, as you can see, this thorough vision of how we might respond uh, to community safety, how we might respond to the issues affecting our community uh, in a way that builds lasting and true community safety. Uh, not with an armed group that comes in uh, when it is an acute situation, but how we can address these issues before they become a crisis situation uh, necessitating intervention. Uh, and how we might, through strengthening our communities, uh, reduce the need for police in the first place. Uh, you might have heard there in the, the preview video, but currently the city of Pittsburgh spends a full third of its city budget on public safety. One out of every three dollars the city of Pittsburgh is spending is on public safety. Uh, and yet there has been no noticeable public safety gains. Uh, and that is because all that money is going into the response after these things reach a crisis point, rather than going into our communities and providing the things they need uh, so that we don't reach a crisis point in the first place. Um, and so, oh, I could talk about this forever, but I'm trying to be cognizant of the time that we're starting to run out. Uh, but so I really hope that all of you have a chance uh, to read through that report uh, and look at the ways that our community envisions that we can bring uh, resources to the community uh, and, and help build lasting peace and safety uh, rather than simply respond once it's become a crisis. Uh, but I do want to say that this is also something APA doesn't just put out a community vision, doesn't just help the community realize a vision, just have that vision sit there. But right now we are deep into working um, at both the city and county level to implement this vision uh, and try to create these conditions that actually exist. Uh, one thing you might be aware of that's coming from the federal level is that in the next couple of years, cities are going to be required to institute a 988 number as an alternative to 911 uh, for things. It, it's starting specifically for, for mental health issues, uh, but we're trying to expand it locally to do any issue that, that doesn't require, that isn't an immediate criminal response, that doesn't require our police, uh, and actually work with this to try to get uh, unarmed groups that are trauma informed with mental health backgrounds uh, and, and that understand substance issues that can come and respond to these kind of things. So rather than an armed guard who will likely uh, or who very much at least has the capacity uh, to uh, increase the problem in the situation, to make the problem worse, that we send people who know how to de escalate the situation and more importantly get people the actual help they need uh, rather than simply stuffing them into ACJ. Uh, so they can experience the horrific conditions there, uh, rather taking them to those actors, those institutions, those places that can help them. But even more importantly, taking those resources from punishment, taking those resources from the torturous conditions in ACJ and using those in our communities so we don't get to those uh, crisis points that necessitate intervention in the first place. And just to thank add a little, um, thank you, uh, Kena and Jesse. Um, right now, the city of Pittsburgh is um, putting this into practice. Like as we speak, um, they're like piloting it. Uh, and, and as Jesse stated, we're working with the Office of Community Health and Safety at the city of Pittsburgh and also the Department of Health and Services in Allegheny County. Um, we're meeting with them consistently on a, on a monthly basis um, to implement this countywide. But right now, the city is operating on a pilot program and um, it needs definitely to be expanded, but I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that, that this is into practice a little bit right now. Um, but the process is that um, the police officers are the ones who actually call and decide once they receive a call, if this person should have someone else come. And that's not the way that this should work. It's not the ideal way for this to work. And so we're all working together um, to implement uh, uh, a model that can work for everyone. But I just wanted people to be aware that um, this is being piloted right now in the city of Pittsburgh. Thank you so much, Kena and Jesse. Or Kena and Jesse, I just said my own name, Brandy and Jesse. <laughs> yes, but thank you to Kena too. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to open it up for uh, some questions. Does anybody have any questions about the reimagined public safety? Again, you can drop it in the chat. You can unmute yourself. If no one has any questions, I have a question for you. <laughs> uh, so my question for you is, what do you believe to be the best alternatives to policing when it comes to public safety? Again, you can drop it in the chat uh, or unmute yourself. Hey, Keen, it's free again. Um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, how a lot of policing is a reactive way of addressing public health and that a really actual, like, important way is, like, redistributing resources and working on community healing that do not force people into, um, you know, desperate situations. Thank you for that, Free. Um, it looks yeah, like Brandon's throw, coming up. Oh, okay. Well, I was just say, I want to throw in on, on that point. Um, one thing I think is really great, especially was read by um, Robert Lawrence from East End Therapist, who's very uh, involved in the reimagining report, especially our section on mental health. Um, one thing that he's, he's doing more and, and, and uh, we, we very much support is the idea of uh, mental health crisis intervention trainings for people and awareness. Uh, and one thing we're trying to do is just make the community more aware of if you see someone experiencing a mental health crisis, here are ways you can react to them and here are resources you can help them point to rather than call 911. Because a lot of these problems too is that our community members don't know what to do uh, if they see someone experiencing a crisis. And the easiest thing to do, right, is call 911. That's your number for crisis, right? Uh, and so another thing, in addition to getting resources out there, uh, we're also pushing efforts to get uh, education out to the community uh, so they know what they could do and not have to rely on these same systems. Thank you for that, Jesse and Free. Um, I see Rodney, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to say, uh, first of all, thanks everyone for presenting and, and for sharing all your information um, uh, and every, for every, all the work that you do um, with all the organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, I just like to say that there are a lot of uh, organizations out there that are, you know, willing, looking and willing to help, you know, and um, so I, I think getting this information in front of as many people as you can is one way to do that. Um, I was a part of a session earlier that talked about um, how the damage PNC is doing and being running some of these opportunity funds that they put in place to help, you know, prevent some of the displacement of these gentrified neighborhoods and and, you know, that's something that you could put in front of people who, at PNC who, you know, volunteer and it's a big organization. There's got to be someone who does that and, you know, so it's, 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 um, and, and they, and they can help find resources and sponsor, you know, sponsorship and grants and things like that. So, so, um, so I know sometimes it can be hard, you know, and to, to find and, and, and do these things. Um, but, but definitely, um, you know, just keep looking for other, you know, people looking to, you know, with the same vision and goals. And, and so I think that, um, you know, on the topic of what we were talking about, about here, um, about, you know, trying to prevent the dehumanizing, you know, experience of going through ACJ through, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of preventing these mental health crises through investing more in communities and, and putting this, um, these things into communities um, uh, and holding these officers accountable. And I, I think that uh, that's, that's great. And I think the best solution I've heard so far today has been uh, the 988 uh, phone number um, that you could call instead. And uh, gosh, if there was a, a, an artist who could make a, a, a song like Logic did to, pr to promote the mental health awareness phone number for the suicide prevention, that'd be great, you know? And, I think this pilot program and, and the things um, that we're doing around it are, are, are um, you know, just what we need to, you know, keep on doing. You know, it's, uh, there's too many people um, in positions of power that are, are, are making it hard to, you know, um, make the, uh, you know, 
to, to let go of it. Right. And so it's, uh, it's tough, you know, when, you know, to even make sure that they're writing the laws the right way so that, you know, you don't need the, the mortgage disclosure act after the fair credit act after, you know, whatever to prevent, you know, redlining and, and institutions from continuing to do these things. So, you know, make sure they have teeth to begin with and they're written the right way so that people can't, you know, don't, don't, don't have to, um, you know, say, well, you know, you have to take the guns out of the jail too, not just prevent them from coming in. Right. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a fight that we're going to, you know, just have to keep on, um, you know, adapting and, and learning and, and passing on um, information to, uh, you know, make sure that people can keep doing it. So I um, appreciate everyone here. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Rodney, for your, like, you just filled out an evaluation. Um, but no, you thank you for like saying everything that you heard today it helped me uh, see what was conveyed and uh, what could be taken away. Um, so uh, thank you for that. One thing I just wanted to um, respond to is the idea about because we are um, discussing like, you know, how we spread this information widely once we do come up with a model to be implemented, like how is everybody going to know now there is another place to call, not just 911 or when is this situation or incident? You know, how do you know when to call 911988? Um, and so thank you for the suggestion of having someone create the song about it because Jasiri X um, often does um, that very thing. He had a song about Jordan Miles, one about Leon Four. I think one is going to be coming out about Jim Rogers. I hope I didn't just leak something, but um, <laughs> um, that would be, that's an idea to put um, in front of him in one hood. So um, thank you very much for that. The only thing I just wanted to go through the chat because I didn't want anyone to be missed. Um, and someone asked, what is the best way to motivate and support community members after a tragedy? Um, so I just wanted to throw that question out there to see if there was anybody who was here that wanted to respond to that, because I don't think we're the only ones who um, have information. But if there's anyone here that wanted to respond to that, um, that would be good. Uh, well, you know, my thing is to organize. Well. <laughs> and to help organize and organize your people, right? Who may not be directly impacted or, you know, to organize folks. And um, so that would be my answer. You know, that that's, you know, we, we definitely know people need direct support, mutual aid, um, but the best support I think helps things from not happening to, the, to people again. And so as much as we can organize uh, our communities and our friends and our families, um, you know, to, to um, uh, make an effort about policy to call their, uh, city council, county council, state representatives and governors, um, as much as we can organize folks to advocate for this issue. So it's not deemed this black and brown issue only, right? It impacts all of us, um, I think is 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 extremely helpful. Um, Kina, go ahead, you want to respond? I mean, you pretty much said what I was going to say. Um, I think support is the key, right? Uh, just especially when a family's going through tra tragedy. Um, in my experience, showing up is the most important thing um you know to let you know to let people know that they're not alone in this that uh that you do care so uh, that's just what i wanted to add and i'm sure we have a ton in the chat and i'm sorry we can't get to you because we have four minutes left <laughs> um so i'm gonna go on to the, the final slide which has all of our in information. Can um, I just go for one second and do this shout out? That we the shout out, sure, absolutely. There was a shout out in the chat that I just wanted to highlight, um, and it was from Mary Parrish, and it was just a shout out to Tracy Merrick and Nancy Ross from First United Methodist Church, who marshaled strong support for Justice for Jim Rogers and Pittsburgh Friends Meeting. Um, is grateful to work to be working with them and so you know we always like to shout the people who are going to work and it's also ways for you to get plugged in um you know firsthand um and so we wanted to shout out first united methodist church as well um and then you know just the whole faith-based community because it's something i've always echoed needs to be involved in this work even more so um and so i don't know if people have seen that there's an april 10th convocation on police violence and justice for jim rogers um and so if you want more information about that kena can make sure she gets that to you afterwards um, but that's also coming from, you know, Mary Parrish and Tracy Merritt. Um, and so when we're talking about support in these times, you know, these are examples of ways to support as well. So thank you to Tracy um, and Nancy. Thank y'all. Thank you for that, Brandy. Uh, definitely appreciate all of our partners doing 
all of the different kinds of work. Um, you know, uh, as an organization, it's important to know that you can't do everything all the time to know when to support those who are uh, leading certain initiatives, situations, and we're greatly appreciative of uh, having such wonderful partners in this work. So just a little bit, um, real quick. Uh, again, get connected with APA. Again, our phone number is 412-708-5200. Um, our email address is info at apa-pgh.org. Website is www.apa-pgh.org. Uh, on Facebook, it's at APAPGH. Same thing for Instagram, at APAPGH. Uh, our Twitter is at APAPGH underscore. Um, we do have various things that we're working on currently that you can volunteer for. Um, I mentioned the committees earlier, so law and policy, uh, outreach and action, education rights, field and electoral, and our uh, youth focus group uh, are all committees that we're looking um, to, to grow. Um, APA Love Days will be starting in May. So we will be looking for volunteers to come help, you know, uh, you know, maybe serve some food, uh, stand, uh, you know, watch over a game attraction or something like that, collect signatures or information. Um, we are also about to launch our in cash bail campaign. So uh, anyone who's part of an organization or individual that would like to uh, help out with the in cash bail campaign, please, again, Jesse, can you drop my email in the chat again? I'm sorry, I'm not able to do it with the screen up, uh, but please, please, please feel uh, free to reach out to me. Um, we also do issue-based canvas work, right? Um, so we canvas entire neighborhoods. Um, we don't just, you know, we don't just go into the community and uh, put things in people uh, on people's doors. We knock on doors. We engage the community. Um, we find out first what the community needs, and then, uh, you know, as well as um, allow them, uh, let them know what we're working on currently, and the, the resources that we have uh, to help them out with. Uh, so we do normally canvas Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to five, which will probably be starting April, May-ish back up. So we're looking for volunteers for that as well. Um, it's always a variety of different things. It's never just one thing. Um, and last but not least, our APA community meetings are the first Tuesday of every month from six o'clock PM to eight o'clock PM. Um, you can find those on our uh, Facebook page underneath events. And, you know, lastly, I just want to say thank you because we're at time. Thank you, Jesse, Brandy, and Lexi. Thank you for the many participants that stuck it out with us for this last hour and a half. Thank you to everyone that's a part of the, uh, the Racial Justice Summit for having us. You are greatly appreciated. I don't know if Jesse or Brandy wanted to say anything to finish. Thanks y'all for being here. <laughs>